Hey there, friends, and welcome to another episode in the Geology 101 Physical Geology series. I am geology professor Sean Wilsey. Thank you for joining me. This video series is modeled after my college course here. It covers the basics of geology. So if you've never had geology or took a course a long time ago, this is a great place to get a refresher or learn some new material in a more formal and structured setting. Thanks again for joining me. So here in episode 12, we're going to focus on the different types of volcanoes. We've develop this somewhat arbitrary but useful classification system to help us make sense of the different types of volcanoes that we see. We spent episode 11 looking at the different types of magmas, uh, effusive versus explosive eruptions, what comes out of a volcano, and now we're going to use some of that knowledge to actually come up with some clearly defined types of volcanoes. As we go through this, realize that this doesn't cover the, the myriad of different volcano types that are out there. Also recognize because this is a, a human construct, a classification system for volcanoes, that there's things that don't quite fit, things that behave differently, volcanic systems that may not fit these parameters that we're setting forth here. Nonetheless, it's a good framework and a good place to start. So let's just um, go ahead and get to it. So we're going to look at uh, different types of eruptions. Mainly, we'll be seeing most of these come out of one centralized vent, one conduit, and we'll see a whole series of volcanoes associated with that, shields, cinder cones, stratovolcanoes, volcanic domes, and calderas. We'll also look here at the top of the list at what happens when volcanoes erupt along a linear fissure, some elongated vent uh, that might stretch for miles or kilometers and rather than one centralized location. Um, this is the way I like to teach this in my 101 class. And what I like to do at this point here is introduce the idea, and it's very simple and a bit silly, but they introduce the idea of nice and naughty volcanoes. So the nice volcanoes would be ones that are mainly effusive eruptions, are mainly erupting lava, like you can see in this bottom left photo, people just enjoying the scenery, just a great sight to take in a volcano from relatively close range. So if I knew that it, there was a fissure eruption going on, a shield volcano or a cinder cone, I would do, this is my personal decision, I would do anything I could to get there, to be fairly close and witness that eruption, obviously from a safe distance. But that would be uh, something that would entice me. With these other types of volcanoes at the bottom of the list here, stratovolcanoes, domes, and calderas, these tend to be eruptions that are very explosive. They're shredding the lava into tiny particles we call ash. And these are the naughty volcanoes. I want no part of these. I do not want to be anywhere near a stratovolcano, a dome, or a caldera uh, when it's behaving badly and erupting in full force. So just a fun way to think about these. Again, just an arbitrary line in the sand, but a way that we might divide these two, um, these volcanoes into two broad categories. So let's look at these a little bit in detail. Uh, we'll toggle back and forth between some slides and some videos as well. So we'll start with the fissure eruptions. We'll start with the nice volcanoes. Um, fissure eruptions, we've seen plenty of these in Iceland over the last year. If you've been following some of those updates and videos I've done there, these are these, these fissures or cracks uh, in the ground and the magma comes up along that crack and erupts along uh, this entire length of this fissure. It mainly is erupting lava. It is throwing lava up into the sky and that can sometimes reach you know, a thousand feet, 300 meters or so, but that lava falls back down close to the vent and then feeds lava flows that move outward in all directions. And so while a hazard to property, this is not much of a hazard to human life. People can get out of the way. Uh, it can, of course, can produce gases and, and maybe minor amounts of ash and tephra. But the, for the most part, again, this is considered an effusive or nice eruption. These can sometimes be, you know, on an order of magnitude beyond what we've seen over the past few years and last for sometimes decades on and off and erupt large quantities of lava that they can actually fill in uh, topography to, to some degree. So this is why if you ever go into eastern Washington and Oregon, the Columbia River Plateau is such a, a large, somewhat level or flat landscape is you've had a lot of those lavas from those eruptions about 16 million years ago that have filled in a lot of the topography and made the present topography uh, kind of flat and level in some places. Um, I, I like to throw in, uh, I'm based here in Idaho, and I like to throw in just some some comparisons that we have here in Idaho. These might exist in your area as well. Uh, but just an hour or two from where I'm located, there's 
a beautiful fissure system that erupted about 2,000 years ago called the Kings Bowl Rift. I actually did a couple of videos here so you could jump over and look for uh, my Southern Idaho playlist and find a couple of videos I did here at Kings Bowl. Uh, just a fantastic example of a fissure eruption from about 2,000 years ago, but yet in our dry, arid climate, it looks still pretty pristine. A uh, quick little video to show you what these look like. I'm sure you've seen these before in other places, but just some clips here from Hawaii. Uh, this is in 2011, the Kamoa Moa fissure. Um, so you can see this thing kind of getting going. This video jumps around to different places. Um, this little section here is fun because I actually know the volcanologist, the geologist who actually filmed this. He's a friend of mine and he's taken some of my students around on the island. So he's literally standing in front of the fissures. But well, what's happening here, you might be able to detect this as we let this run, is the gas coming out of the cracks starts moving towards him, starts filling in these cracks. You might see chunks of the ground fall away as I get the the video playing here in a second what's happening is the the fissure is opening up like a pair of scissors towards him towards his view and the story he told me was you know he was excited he was standing there rolling the tape and taking the video but the helicopter pilot who was parked you know just a few yards away was just you know not happy with the situation and wanting to leave immediately and once um, you'll see here in a second a little chunk of rock falls out of this fissure as it starts moving towards him and that's when the video kind of cuts out. So you can see some of the lava starting to come up here. A little chunk of rock's gonna fall out of that crack right there. And then, yeah, and then, and then they hightailed it out of there. Um, but this was a fantastic example of a fissure eruption. You can see here some of the lava flowing down into another existing crack or fissure from some older eruption. So you get some pretty uh, impressive uh, features and filling in of topography from these flows. It's obviously inundating this part of the, the forest here. Um, there's that lava fall right there down into that fracture. Uh, just a really impressive and fantastic example, um, as well as the ones we've had in Iceland uh, the past few years. So, so there you go. There's a great example of a fissure eruption uh, helicopter view. And here's some views from the ground level. And there's some people taking it in, right? Like, um, you know, you can't just stand there forever and idly watch. You got to be a little bit proactive about moving around, but still a fantastic thing to witness. So, um, okay, so there's our first type of volcano, the shield or the fissure eruptions. Uh, we'll now switch over to our next type of volcano, which is also still in the nice category, but this is what we're going to call the shield volcano. So now we're going to erupt that lava from one centralized vent. And sometimes these fissure eruptions can develop or evolve into shield volcanoes. As the fissure, as the, the system winds down, the lava can become localized in one part of the fissure. And if it continues to erupt this effusive lava over time, it can build a, a large shield volcano like we have here at Mauna Ulu in Hawaii in 1974. And it's named a shield volcano, of course, pretty obvious, but the very gentle slopes, the convex shape of the of the volcano makes it look like a, a Roman warrior shield sitting on the ground. That that outline there, that shape is very similar to that. But it's mainly made out of these low viscosity lavas. Not a lot of stuff is erupted into the sky, not much tephra or ash. Again, a pretty safe volcano to watch from a safe distance um, and mainly basaltic. Again, these low viscosity lavas, that's the main thing we see. Um, shield volcanoes make up some of the largest volcanoes on our planet and in our solar system, like at Olympus Mons. This is Mount Aloha on the Big Island, which is just this enormous volcano that sticks up um, you know, 13,000 feet above sea level. Um, you know, 4,000 plus meters above sea level. And if you actually take its flank all the way down below the ocean level to the actual floor of the ocean, it's actually much bigger than that. In fact, um, Mount Akea, which is its neighbor and is slightly taller than Mount Aloha, there's an argument to be made. This is just someone's uh, simplified uh, diagram. But Mount Akea is actually the tallest mountain on earth if we measure it from its base to its summit it just so happens that you know more than half of mount akea's flanks or height is buried by the ocean whereas everest um, from the platform it sits on it's actually a little bit smaller than mount akea by about a uh, little less than 2,000 meters so anyway depends on bragging rights there what you want to call it a uh, quick animation for 
the shield volcanoes would look something like this. This is just a fun little animation just to help you visualize what's going on. So here's these low viscosity lava flows pouring out, a little bit of ash at the summit, a little bit of tephra being thrown out onto the ground, but mainly these volcanoes build up their size and uh, build up their volume just with these successive lava flows that pour out in all directions. Low viscosity lava, gentle slopes, uh, and that's the idea with our shield volcanoes. Uh, switching over to the next volcano type, we're still in the nice category. We've got one more nice volcano to go. So our next volcano is a cinder cone. So now let's imagine that same low viscosity basaltic lava um, erupting, but there's a little bit more gas content in the magma. Or maybe it's still basalt, but it's just a tiny bit stickier. And so it's trapped a little bit more gas. And so it's a little bit more gas rich and, and it's a tiny bit more explosive. And when I say explosive, I mean just locally explosive. So now we are throwing our little clots of lava up into the air. They're airborne. It's tephra. And those are raining down around the vent over time to form this cone. So these would be locally explosive. You could still watch this from, you know, half a mile or so away, depending on the winds and such. Um, these are very small compared to some of our other volcano types we're gonna look at. They're mainly, you know, less than a thousand feet or 300 meters in height in general. They typically have a crater at the summit, but this entire mass, this bulk you're seeing here is nothing more than the accumulation of all the airborne lava that's come out of the, the vent and then piled up around the vent over time. So it's just a big pile of loose rock cinders, these like golf ball to marble sized rocks. Um, if you ever have to hike up one of these, it's quite an ordeal. They're very steep. It's loose. You take two steps up, you slide back a foot. Uh, very frustrating. These are also what we call monogenetic volcanoes. For the most part, these just erupt once as opposed to one of the next volcanoes we'll get to, um, like the strata volcanoes, which are polygenetic. They can erupt and do erupt, multi have multiple episodes of eruptions. But cinder cones pretty much just have their one eruptive phase and then when it's over it's over you might get another cinder cone developing or erupting nearby but that specific cinder cone once it has its heyday it's pretty much over and done with and that's why you see cinder cones occupying large fields if you find one cinder cone look around you'll probably find several of them they often form sometimes hundreds of them in a grouping in, in a specific region and that's because these cinders don't have much structural strength so if mag magma were to develop in the subsurface, it's more likely to punch out into some new area rather than reoccupy uh, this original vent here. And this, this mountain um, here just doesn't have the strength to uh, allow for subsequent eruptions. Sometimes we'll see with these things lava flows breaking out the base. So you might get this beautiful symmetrical shape disrupted a little bit because lava flows carry chunks of it away uh, into a different direction. And again, back to a fun little animation that'll show you uh, just graphically how these erupt. So here is the cinder cone growing through the vent uh, pushing out these airborne pieces of lava, small little clots of lava that don't go very far. The ash might drift, you know, a few miles or kilometers away, but generally everything stays pretty close to the vent. Uh, and then it just piles up and it's, it gets to be quite steep. So much steeper than the cinder cone volcanoes. But yeah, if there's a, if, or the uh, shield volcanoes, but if there's a cinder cone volcano erupting, man, sign me up. I want to go see it. Um, that would be just, that would be better than fireworks for sure. Okay, let's get, now that we've covered our three nice volcanoes, let's take a look at the naughty volcanoes. And we'll start with the stratovolcanoes. When people think about volcanoes, this is typically what they think about. A big mountain, cone-shaped, more or less symmetrical on all sides, might be capped with snow, might not. Uh, a crater near the top and just, you know, continual you know, outgassing of material from that volcano. You might be seeing, you know, ash or a little bit of gas coming out of it. Um, but this is what a lot of people think about. And really, if you were to cut these volcanoes open, they're made of 
layers of lava and layers of ash that alternate sometimes in complicated ways. And that's why they're called stratovolcanoes. Strata means layers. And when you dissect these or erosion cuts through them later, you can actually see that they are composed of layers of ash from explosive eruptions and layers of lava from more effusive eruptions. This is what I like to call the bipolar volcano because sometimes they erupt very explosively. Think about Mount St. Helens in 1980, which killed 50 or so people. Um, but then they can also erupt more effusively in 2000, from 2004 to 2008, Mount St. Helens also had an eruption, but instead of producing ash and being explosive, it was just oozing out this thick pasty lava in its summit crater that didn't go very far, that wasn't a hazard to people or property. Um, and so that's kind of that Jekyll and Hyde type behavior that we often see with stratovolcanoes. They can produce a lot of different rock types, but I like my students to mainly associate these with andesites. That's probably the most dominant rock type we see with stratovolcanoes, although they can erupt a, a you know, variety of different materials. They're also fairly um, tied to and connected with subduction zones. If you see a subduction zone anywhere on planet Earth, chances are somewhere nearby you're going to see stratovolcanoes. So they tend to form, their magma compositions tend to be a product of that subduction process of water being driven down into the asthenosphere and generating magmas that way. Stratovolcanoes are sneaky and over the course of human civilization we've seen a lot of civilizations uh, built around stratovolcanoes and it's um, it's because of their recurrence intervals of having big eruptions every few hundred years or so there might be one big eruption that maybe you know decimates a society or takes out a civilization uh, but in the subsequent years after that eruption people will tend to forget it become complacent and will will move back in closer to the volcano there's probably streams coming off of it supplies of water those volcanic soils can be very productive for agriculture uh, so there's a number of reasons why people over history have tended to live near stratovolcanoes and just a few examples there uh, but there's plenty more out there that you might look at as well. Uh, back to our fun little animation to show you what they might look like if we were to look at a stratovolcano. They're also called a composite volcano, so you sometimes see that as well. But this will show you nicely the behavior I was talking about. So here we have a big explosive eruption of ash that coats the outside of the volcano, and then some sticky lava, and then a big explosive eruption of ash and then some sticky lava pours down the flank. And this is very cartoonish. It's not always, you know, one after the other and on all sides, but you get the idea here. These, this sort of bipolar behavior uh, that makes up these, these stratovolcanoes. I prefer stratovolcanoes to composite cone, uh, but they're essentially synonymous and people sometimes use one versus the other as they can. Um, quick picture here of a place just to my west, the three sisters in Oregon. So a nice view there of these three stratovolcanoes. And then you can just see Mount Hood out here in the distance off to the north. And if you could see further than that, you could see St. Helens and then Rainier um, and a, the whole string of the Cascades coming out there. But you can see this lava flow here in the, in the foreground. Uh, so there's a episode of a more effusive or passive type of behavior from this volcano. Uh, and then of course we have these more explosive ash rich eruptions as well. Okay, on to our next volcano type, sticking with the naughty volcanoes. Then we have volcanic domes. So now let's imagine we have very high viscosity, silica rich lava, rhyolitic lava as we've talked about. And that lava has built up Maybe there's a little bit of gas in it initially, but let's say the gases are largely depleted. Well, that magma as it erupts is going to just well up and make a very steep sided, unstable hill or mountain, depending on your perspective, of rhyolitic lava. Might be a lot of obsidian in there, could be a little bit of pumice, depending on if it starts uh, with a more explosive phase. Uh, and these will generally be, you know, hundreds of feet tall, maybe a thousand feet, you know, 300 meters or so. And they can be either parasitic or independent. So sometimes they are attached to a larger volcanic edifice, like a stratovolcano, like we see a lava dome or a volcanic dome at the summit of Mount St. Helens today that uh, has started forming after the 1980 eruption. And then became reactivated in two, and built a new dome from 2004 to 2008. Or these can actually be out by themselves completely independent and, and not associated with or attached to 
a larger volcanic structure. So these are the volcanic domes or the lava domes. And let me show you uh, the animation and then we'll go look at one here in southern Idaho that's kind of neat and spectacular. And we have a few few examples of this. So here is, um, oh, first we have this. Let's do this. This is good. Um, this is a time lapse from the USGS showing how Mount St. Helens uh, the lava dome there grew from 2004 to 2008. So essentially they've got a camera up there. It's taking a photo every day when the weather's clear and then splicing all those photos together to put this time lapse together. And what you'll see here, this is the old dome from the 80s here, this big eroded pile of rubble. We're looking inside the crater of Mount St. Helens, but focus on this area over here to the left. And what you're gonna see is this light gray rock just being pushed out like a piston. This is lava. It's not glowing, it's not incandescent. Uh, here we are during the daytime because it's a lower temperature lava, so it's not as hot as Hawaiian or Icelandic lavas, which tend to be much higher temperature. It's a different composition. Remember, it's, it's more andesitic or, or dacitic, rhyolitic. Um, it's more silica rich. But there you can see it growing, pushing out of the ground. We're kind of just going day by day here when the weather's clear. Um, and it built this big, massive structure here that went into 2005. Now you can see another one forming here in the middle of the view, well into 2005. Um, there it is just pushing out like a piston, but it becomes over steepened and that's why you see it kind of eroding down. This thing was like nice and smooth at one point, but because this lava is so steep and it's unstable and there's more pressure pushing more lava up to the surface, it's prone to these collapse episodes. Uh, so here we are in 2005 in August and then we'll skip into it kind of skips a lot of the winter because everything's covered harder to see. We're in September now a little bit of snow. And then once we get into 2006, um, we'll see it start to form again. So here we are, winter of 2006. Here we are in May when the weather starts to clear a little bit. And there you can see that, that piston just pushing out of the ground, June, July, uh, somewhere right about here. I don't know if this was this exact date. Um, oh, you can't see the dates there at the bottom. Sorry about that. But now we're August 2006. Um, somewhere in this in this time period, uh, Buddy and I, my friend Darren and I, hiked the, to the top of St. Helens from the south side and actually looked down and were able to watch it. And I think it was early August 2006, so it was on or about this date here. Um, and then going into the end of 2006, uh, things kind of slowed down a little bit. It was still extruding this silica rich lava again so you're looking at the the growth and the eruption of a lava dome it was deforming the glacier around the outside as well um, but really a, a spectacular um, eruption nonetheless and a nice little job there by the usgs to put together all those um, images to see how these lava or volcanic domes grow you can call them lava domes or volcanic domes uh, okay so our final naughty volcano is a caldera um, calderas are different than regular volcanoes because they actually form by collapse. And so there's fundamentally a big difference between a crater, a pit at the top of a volcano that's formed by particles being thrown out, ejected from the vent, and a caldera, which is a much larger feature that forms by wholesale collapse of the surface down, uh, usually because so much of the magma in the subsurface has been ejected out of vents somewhere in the region that it actually collapses down in on itself. So this is Aniakchak caldera in Alaska. Uh, of course, one of the more famous calderas is Crater Lake in Oregon, uh, which actually collapsed in on itself. So typically they need to be large. I think the criteria we've come up with is like a mile or so in diameter, um, you know, one and a half kilometers, something like that. You can get calderas with other magma types in my class in 101 just to keep things simple at this level i like my students to associate these explosive calderas with rhyolitic lava because that's commonly what we see and you do see these at subduction zones sometimes like with crater lake you can also see them at continental hotspots like at yellowstone so a similar type of thing um, and so you get these things again caused by collapse of the whole system downward and we have a fun last one last animation here um, to show you how these form. In this case, they've taken the Crater Lake model as the one to show. So prior to Crater Lake existing, there was a large steep-sided stratovolcano called Mount Mazama. 
Uh, and then this had a large eruption, oh, what was it, like 7,600 years ago. Uh, it erupted and, and evacuated so much of the magma from the subsurface that it was left unsupported and portion of the volcano collapsed in on itself. They get a lot of snow and rain in the Cascades. So that big pit, that caldera, filled in with water over time to become uh, Crater Lake, which is known and much loved today. And then there was a little bit of magma left in uh, the system that eventually erupted and made a cute little uh, cinder cone in the lake called Wizard Island. Um, but just a fantastic place to see caldera. Steep sides all around this thing, uh, essentially faults that allowed the, the middle to drop down relative to the, the rim here. So these are the calderas. Um, so at this point, we've covered all the volcano types. Uh, so we've covered fissure eruptions, shield volcanoes, cinder cones. Those were our nice volcanoes, mainly erupting basalt. We've looked at three types of na na nasty or naughty volcanoes, um, stratovolcanoes, volcanic domes, and calderas. So to end this episode, just with a little bit of assessment, let's go ahead and do a couple of fun questions, quiz questions. And then what we'll do in our next episode, in episode 13, is we'll look at, we'll round out our, this volcano discussion by looking at volcanic hazards. What are some specific things we see associated with volcanoes that cause uh, harm to humans, death and destruction, uh, threatened, pr threatened property, uh, and that sort of thing. So, so let's go ahead and go with these. So here is a volcano. I give you the size of each one to some degree. Uh, I didn't put these in meters. Sorry, that's probably a hundred and I don't know, uh, eighty-ish meters, maybe you're almost two hundred meters in size. So think about how it erupts. Is it effusive or explosive? Think about the material. I, obviously looking at a photo is not as good as being there, picking up a rock and investigating it, and making more observations. But nonetheless, I think we can um, get, take a good stab at these either way. So need, if you need to pause the video to answer this or to think a little bit longer, go ahead. But the answer to this one is... B, cinder cone. This is a cinder cone. We can see the dark material here. That suggests that it's probably basalt. Um, steep sided. It's not very tall. It's not a huge mountain. Um, it has a crater at the top. And it doesn't look like it's made out of flowing lava. It looks like it's made out of little particles. Again, we're looking at it from some distance away. Uh, and so that makes it tricky. But if you can if you can identify these on a screen, you probably could do a little better job out there in the field. So here's another one. Take a stab at this one. Make some observations first and then see if you can classify this volcano. Pause if needed. Okay, so what can we observe here? We have a very steep sided cone. I guess I didn't provide scale here, so I apologize for that, but this thing is probably this thing is in the thousands of feet tall range or you know several hundred meters range maybe a thousand meters total um, we can see that it's emitting a little bit of ash and so based on its size and shape and the fact that it's emitting a little bit of ash there this would best be uh, labeled a stratovolcano so the answer there would be c all right let's do another one here a photo i took in iceland uh, so look over the tourist heads of, in their cars there and this immense feature here, taking up most of the screen, is another volcano called Skjaldbreiður, if I pronounce that right. So pause the video if needed. And this one, gentle slopes, um, not very steep, and but, but very broad, This and very dark in color, so likely basaltic. Again, not knowing exactly from this distance, this would, of course would be a shield volcano. Answer there is D. Let's do another one here. I think I have a couple more of these for you. Uh, get my head out of the way a bit. So make some observations there. 400 feet, so a little over 100 meters, 120, 130 meters, something like that. Go ahead and pause if needed. And dun, 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 this is a lava dome or volcanic dome. This thing is steep sided. Um, it's made out of this lighter colored material here. Uh, so it's probably more felsic in composition than mafic. And as the lava is pushed out like toothpaste from a tube, it just sort of uh, wells up, ultimately collapses because it's over steepened. And you can see some of the gases escaping there as well. Okay, this is our last one here, team. So see if you can get this one right. This one I took 
um, here in southern Idaho along the freeway got a little house up there for scale you can see the fence in the foreground and we're looking at this this one's a little next level though because we're not just looking at the volcano type we're also looking at the type of rock or material that this volcano would mainly erupt okay so looking at the size and shape it's very broad it's very gentle sided this is a shield volcano and shield volcanoes are mainly associated with low viscosity lava very runny so that best matches basalt which is e so hopefully that was helpful that is our episode number 12 on volcano types hopefully that was good a good review or a good lesson for you depending on the case and we will be back with another episode, episode 13, to focus on volcanic hazards. As always, I appreciate your support for these videos. Uh, whatever you can contribute or leave a nice comment or be sure to like and make sure you're subscribed as well. Thanks so much and we'll see you next time.